Thank you so much for everyone tuning in tonight. Uh, my name is Alex Pfeiffer. I'm the exhibits manager at the Ames History Museum, and I want to welcome you to our program tonight. Thank you for joining us. Um, Casey is going to put up a poll on our screen right now. So if you please indicate how many people are watching with you today on your device. Um, this will help us get a more accurate account of attendees. So thank you for all, all for participating. There is also a question on there tonight about whether you'd like to see future programming in person, virtual, on Zoom, or a hybrid. So please fill that out. That'll kind of help us go forward with our future lecture series and figure out a way to best present all this inf great information to people. A um, couple other housekeeping things. This program is being recorded. So if you need to leave early or you lose connection, no worries. The recording will be emailed to you. If you have questions for our speaker during the lecture, I encourage you to use the question and answer box below at the bottom bar. And we'll be monitoring the questions throughout the lecture and our speaker will have time to answer them at the end of the program. So please, if you, if you think of something during the middle there, feel free to add it into the questions and answers in the middle of the program and we will come back to them at the end there. All right, this presentation is in conjunction with the exhibit currently on display in the museum's windows a Woman's Places Everywhere, Groundbreaking Women in Ames History. It's a four-part series and currently on display is part one, Women in Science, featuring Dr. Margaret Sloss, Dr. Jenny Greist, Elmina and Alda Wilson, and of course, Dr. Ada Hayden, who we'll be mentioning tonight. There's also a virtual exhibit in conjunction with that, filled with 360 degree photos, along with more information which also includes an inside photo of the Ada Hayden Herbarium. Thanks to tonight's presenter, Deb, who let me come over there. Uh, gosh, it feels like a long time ago, back in the middle of winter, <laughs> hiking through campus. Um, so if you've never seen it, uh, we know it's not really, you know, it's not like a museum you can necessarily go to freely. So if you've never seen inside the Herbarium, there's a nice photo in there. You can check out how they store a lot of their collections in and find out a little bit more information on there. And I'm sure Deb will be mentioning some more about that. So this exhibit um, will be up through the end of June. So be sure to go check it out in the windows on Douglas Avenue um, near 5th and Douglas. And part two, Women in Government will be on display starting in July. So these exhibits are supported by the Ames Convention and Visitors Bureau Community Grant Program. So we wanna thank them for making this pop for the exhibit possible, which led to this great programming. And now for our speaker, Deb Lewis. She has been the curator of the Iowa State University's Ada Hayden Herbarium since 1984. In this role, she not only oversees the care and growth of the herbarium, but she also has opportunities for outreach to, Iowa, to Iowans across the state and is engaged in research projects studying Iowa's plants. She's a fellow of the Iowa Academy of Science that was a co-founder of the Iowa Native Plant Society in 1995 from 2006 to 2012, she served on the State uh, Pres Preserves Advisory Board, having been appointed to the board by Governor Colbert. She received the Olav Smeedel Conservation Award from the Ames Chapter of the Isaac Walton League in Story County Conservation in 2010 and ISU's Carol Ringenberg Award in 2017. So we want to thank Deb for presenting this program in conjunction with our exhibit tonight and Deb, without further ado, I'll let you take it away. Thank you for that introduction, Alex, and thanks for inviting me to speak this evening. And um, I, my t-shirt isn't able really to be seen well here, so I'm gonna, and it looks like it's, um, we would be reading it in reverse if it were. So I will just say that it says, women who behave rarely make history. We will maybe consider that as we reach the uh, end of the formal part of the presentation this evening. When I first came to Iowa State in 1984, there were still several faculty members on the staff who knew and had worked with Ada Hayden. In fact, I heard about her before I even moved here. Dwayne Isley was on sabbatical at the University of North Carolina in 1983 while I was a grad student there. And he regaled us with some wonderful Ada Hayden stories. But for tonight, 
I'll share one that Lois Tiffany told, which was one, in fact, that Ada Hayden told on herself. Dr. Hayden was visiting New Orleans for national botanical meetings. And as she was walking back to her hotel, it came a downpour. She stepped beneath the awning near a doorway to wait out the worst of the storm. Soon a woman stepped outside and asked if Dr. Hayden was looking for a job. She asked, what kind of job? The woman said it was to be a lady of the evening, quote, quote, you know. According to Dr. Tiffany, Ada Hayden was a bit flustered to have been asked. And wouldn't it be interesting to know her reply to that woman's job offer? But just who was Ada Hayden? A lot of information was lost over the years, but the staff of the ISU Parks Library the Ames History Museum and I, along with a few others, have tried to piece together what we can. Dr. Isley, who I mentioned earlier, wrote a tribute article that was published in 1989 in the Proceedings of the Iowa Academy of Science. And that, along with his stories and those of the other faculty members, and obviously the materials that survived, have helped me and others try to understand who Ada Hayden was. And it's a privilege to share about her this evening, as she has been one of my heroes. But before we get into the presentation, I'd like to acknowledge that much of the information and most of the images have come from the Parks Library Digital Initiatives site, the Library's Special Collections and University Archives, the Ames History Museum, and my department, especially the um, Ada Hayden Herbarium where I work. And fortunately, one of the faculty members in my department, Dr. Jar George Kanapas, found that some Ada Hayden materials had been removed from an old campus building's attic where it had been stored and uh, after that was thrown into a dumpster. So he removed those materials from the dumpster and tucked them away in a closet here in Bessie Hall, where our department is housed. And these were discovered years later, and they included numerous photographs and other treasures. And most of those materials are now in the library's special collections. This photo was likely among those items that Dr. Kanapas found. We don't know much about it. Possibly it's of a family reunion. But we see that it includes a photo of Ada when she was young, with the arrow uh, in the middle pointing to her. Uh, we see this arrow pointing to her mother. And probably the arrow with the question mark is pointing to her father. This photo reminds us that Ada Hayden had a family and life beyond just her work and accomplishments at Iowa State. She was an only child. And in her adult life, she was responsible for her parents' care for the time that they uh, were living. But let's back up a little to her birth and early years. Ada Hayden was born on August 14, 1884. She grew up here in Ames, or rather just uh, northwest of Ames uh, at that time, now included within Ames. And she spent nearly her entire life here in Ames. The family farm was then just outside the north edge of Ames in or near what is now the Stonebrook neighborhood near the west edge of Ada Hayden Heritage Park. The road to the east of Ada Hayden's land marked as primary road in this 1926 flat map is now US Highway 69. And you can see where the Skunk River makes its loop just across from what is now Ada Hayden Heritage Park. I'm not sure when her father, David Maitland Hayden, arrived here in the Ames area, but he is said to have been an early settler of Ames. As we see, he lived until 1938. Her mother's family may have arrived even earlier. These photos 
of Christina Jane Shearer Hayden, Ada's mother. We see that she died quite a few years before her husband in 1925. I wonder what the impact might have been on Ada. Did she have to provide a lot of care for her father? But getting back to the earlier history, Mr. and Mrs. Robert Bruce Shearer, Ada's maternal grandparents, owned 80 acres up until 1902 on the property adjacent to the Hayden Farm. Farwell Brown notes in his History of Ames that they were early pioneers in Story County. And at least two of Ada's uncles also lived nearby. The farm was Ada's playground in her youth and her sanctuary as she grew older. It also helped create her love of natural areas from an early age. For unknown reasons, the farm was transferred to her by her parents in 1918, and she had to sell the farm in 1941. I can imagine that she was heartbroken to lose this place that was so special. Ada's father's land and that of her relatives that was adjoining was apparently quite variable in terrain. There were gravelly prairie knolls with past flowers, the first flowers to bloom in spring. There were also spots with marsh marigolds and small white lady slipper orchids. She took an early interest in plants and she would bring blooming wildflowers to school. And we'll hear a story about that in a few moments. Beyond this, we don't know a lot about her personal life. She was a member of the Congregationalist Church, now UCC Congregational, near the post office. And at some point, at least um, according to Alex, as early as 1938, she moved to the Cranston Apartments on Lincoln Way. So as we conclude this bio biographical section, I'll note that she died of cancer on August 12, 1950 just two days before her 66th birthday. But let's now move to her education and career at Iowa State College. And as we segue to that, we see an example of part of one of Ada's herbarium specimens. As we can see, this specimen of marsh marigolds was collected on the Hayden Farm. Note the precise information that she includes on the label. Locality of Franklin Township, Section 27, three miles northwest of Ames. The habitat is similarly detailed. She says, in a marsh along a small stream at the entrance to the Hayden Farm. Her label is far more complete than those of her contemporaries in which the locality might just say Ames and without or with only the briefest description of the habitat. Her specimen is numbered as 2177. I don't know whether that means that she had collected already 2,000 specimens um, prior to that or whether um, she, it was a while before she got around to labeling her collections, which sometimes is the case, and she was numbering them sequen sequentially as she got to them. But if indeed she had collected over 2,000 specimens, uh, by the time she was a junior in college, that's almost unheard of. But let's turn to her college education by first introducing her mentor. Lewis H. Pamel came to Iowa State in 1889, starting out as the one-man botany department. By the time he retired in 1926, it was a large, vibrant department to be proud of. He encouraged anyone to study botany, and that included George Washington Carver, who was Iowa State's first African-American student. And as you may already be aware, Carver got both his bachelor's and master's degrees here, and that was between the years of 1891 and 1896, when he left here to go to Tuskegee. Pamela also encouraged women to major in botany, and many did. We see in this photo that there are several women in 
what I would refer to as a botanical laboratory. Um, and it looks like a great place for learning about plants. And it was a, perhaps about the time that this photo was taken that Pamela visited Ada Hayden's junior high or high school classroom. As the story goes, he spotted a small bouquet of past flowers on the teacher's desk and was curious about where they had come from. They were from the Hayden farm. And in that encounter, he met Ada and encouraged her in her fondness for plants, even at that early age. This love of plants drew her to the study of botany at Iowa State College. And of course, Lewis Pamel was her advisor. She graduated from Iowa State in 1908, having been an honor student, a basketball player, and a member of several college organizations, including a sorority. In 1909, she headed to St. Louis for study at Washington University, where she obtained her master's degree in 1910. Her master's study was of the algae that were found on the grounds of the Missouri Botanical Garden in St. Louis. And I'm sure that that was a wonderful place for doing research as it's still a beautiful gardens and they have a large herbarium today and it's a wonderful place to visit. When she returned here to begin work on a second master's degree, uh, she was able to complete that by 1911. And so that second master's is from Iowa State. I'm not sure of the topic of her research for the second master's degree. Because there wasn't yet a PhD program, I'm guessing that, the, that her research topic was the first stage for the research that she undertook for her PhD eventually. The start of her studies of plant anatomy as it related to prairie ecology. She completed her studies in 1918. And from her work, she wrote two papers that were published in the prestigious American Journal of Botany. Her PhD degree awarded in 1918 was the first in any field for a woman at Iowa State and was only the fourth for either gender. And during the time that Ada Hayden studied plants, botany was largely a descriptive science. Instead of grinding small samples of plant tissue and running gels to determine the DNA, as many botanists do today, whole plants were compared with one another to determine relationships or studies of the plants growing in a particular area were done, or actual stems and leaves were looked at microscopically. Hmm, those all required being outdoors to collect the material that you wanted to study. Unless you were able to borrow some herbarium specimens that we will talk about in a few minutes. And all of those things are still done by some of us today. Ada's master's degree project while at the Washington University, based on her studies of the algae at the Missouri Botanical Garden, and her dissertation project comparing the anatomy of prairie plants would still qualify for degrees today. So after getting her PhD, she was appointed to the faculty as an assistant professor. Here we see an outline of her career. And even though she was an instructor while um, working on her graduate degree, she was uh, an assistant professor throughout the entire remainder of her tenure. And we can imagine that as such, her paycheck wasn't very large. Fortunately, she approached what she did with a passion that went far beyond getting those small paychecks. In her faculty role, she could expand her research to other topics, including conservation. Pamela and other botanists and even members of the Federation of Women's Clubs were pushing for the establishment of state parks. But parks were people places mostly wooded areas where people could picnic or camp or otherwise enjoy being outdoors. And parks were really needed 
people were trying to do those things on private property, not their own, and were leaving a mess, having the wire fences and so on. So yes, parks were needed. However, Ada Hayden, on the other hand, started early in her career trying to draw attention to the loss of Iowa's prairies. And we can imagine that a prairie wouldn't be the best place for people to go for recreation, uh, unless you just are in love with seeing what's there as far as the, the wildlife and plants that you might encounter. At a 1916 meeting held on the Iowa State campus, while others reported on various places like Backbone and ledges that should become state parks, Ada Hayden presented the first call for the protection of prairie areas. We note that her writing is beautifully descriptive as she makes her plea. Iowa is said to be a prairie state, but what is prairie to the present generation? Within 40 or 50 years, the broad stretches of tall shining grass trembling in the sunlight are tossed by the breezes into billowy waves Gorgeous as the season progresses with its pageant of brilliant hued flowers is fast passing. Few but the farm boy and the meadowlark know where the swamp now lingers, where the marigolds glitter in the marsh, where the red brown knoll fanned by the winds of March turn pale lavender as the past flower wakes in the spring. What park planting can equal a mile or two of flaming turk's cap lily, which frequents the damp native prairie in July, or the white beds of nodding anemones, the red and white sweet william, the purple patches of gauzy spiderwort, the gorgeous butterfly weed, the glowing goldenrod, and the banks of stately radiant sunflower. All these plants are carefully cultivated by florists in parts of the country where they are not native. Why not preserve now at a small cost what cannot be replaced at any cost? Now these reports on state parks and Ada Hayden's call for prairie preserves were published in 1919. And while state parks were indeed soon established, with Backbone State Park as the first in 1920, she couldn't get any support at that time for prairie conservation. In fact, Pamel really um, had been working with the farmers and the farmers didn't like prairie growing next to their field. They thought that weeds crept into their pastures. And so even her um, mentor wouldn't be excited about prairie conservation. So in the meantime, she worked on projects with Pamel, and these resulted in publications with her as a co-author with him. Then following his retirement in 1926 and his death in 1931, she initiated her own project. In the 1930s, she did an extensive plant survey of Clay and Palo Alto counties, which Dwayne Isley proclaimed was the best such study that had been done in Iowa. Following the completion of this study, she was free to turn back to the dream of prairie preserves. She got $100 from the Iowa Academy of Science. And with this funding, she traveled the state, studying every prairie site that she could find. From these, she selected 22 that represented the diversity of kinds of prairies to be found, wet prairies, mesic, and dry prairies sand prairies, loam prairies, and lust, and so on. Then she took her passion on the road, speaking and writing about prairies to capture the public's interest. She was at least partly successful during her lifetime. By the time of her death in 1950, three areas had been purchased by the state. The largest of these which she had reported as Lime Springs Prairie in Howard County in her report, was renamed Hayden Prairie in September, shortly following her death. In all of these projects, she
She collected and dried specimens to document her work. For example, in 1941, she collected this gay feather from Dickinson County, and she collected more than 14,000 specimens for the Iowa State Herbarium. Now, I noted in the description of this talk that it said something about 40,000 specimens, but uh, um, it was actually closer to 14,000. But it's not only the quantity, but also the quality of her specimens that stand out. In 1934, she was officially named as the herbarium curator, and she retained that title also until her death. Dr. Hayden indeed had many talents, including skills of botanical observation that allowed her to contribute to botany in Iowa. And those observations took her to all kinds of habitats, including wetlands and lakes, especially during the studies that she did in the Clay and Palo Alto County area. And she had a homemade boat that she would load on top of her car and go uh, zooming off, or not really zooming, I'm sure, but uh, heading off to those places where she could uh, continue her studies. In fact, um, there's kind of a funny story that uh, Dr. Isley told me about. And it seems that one day Ada Hayden was walking across campus prior to getting her boat loaded and getting in her car and heading north. And she ran into one of the university or college administrators. And he stopped her and said, Dr. Hayden, you are not suitably dressed for being on campus today. And all five foot two in height of her looked up at him and said, and sir, you are not prepared to and dressed to go out to the wetlands. <laughs> so uh, anyway, she must have been quite a character. But back to her talents. Um, she was skilled in writing and editing that led to more than 20 publications that are among the best of her time. And she is also known for her artistic skills of photography, drawing, and painting. And she produced numerous black and white photographs to document her work. But she also created a large set of lantern slides for her presentations to help her audience recognize the beauty of the prairies. She not only did the photography, but then she hand painted many of them to bring those images to life. And we see some of those here. And these are from the Iowa State uh, University Special Collections. But I think that there are also some of her lantern slides that are at the Ames History Museum. She illustrated numerous publications, those of her own, those of Pamels, and of her other colleagues. And here we see a series of detailed illustrations of plants of trees in winter condition for a booklet that she was involved with creating for Iowa State Extension. Let's take a moment to review some of her accomplishments. She was, as, all, as we've already mentioned, uh, the first woman to receive a PhD at ISU. Uh, she did research and published a lot of papers on Iowa's flora. She was an early prairie conservationist, and she was the curator of the herbarium and also added many specimens uh, to it from across the state and from some of her travels to other states as well. Yet with all of this work, she was still largely unappreciated during her life. In fact, when she died, as we mentioned earlier, she was still an assistant professor. Eventually, though, her passions, talents, hard work, and accomplishments were recognized, although unfortunately not until after her death. The first is Hayden Prairie State Preserve, named, that was named in her honor in 1950, as I said earlier, just a few months or a month or two after her death. 
Just before Dr. Isley stepped down as director of the herbarium when he retired in 1989, he and I were able to officially get the herbarium renamed from the Iowa State University Herbarium to the Ada Hayden Herbarium. And this recognized both the quality and numbers of specimens that she had contributed to the herbarium, as well as her service as the curator for 18 years. And many of us are aware of and have visited Ada Hayden Heritage Park, part of the Ames Parks and Recreation Department. And then in 2007, she was inducted into the Iowa Women's Hall of Fame. It was a long overdue induction in the opinion of many of us, but finally she is recognized um, in that special place. I hope that you agree that she richly deserves our accolades and recognition for her efforts. Her work in prairie conservation and her desire for the state to set aside prairie preserves eventually led to the creation of the Iowa State Preserve System, which is now under the oversight of the Iowa Department of Natural Resources. And there are over 90 state preserves now scattered throughout the state. And not all of those are prairies, although quite a number of them are. And uh, it also includes um, historic sites, uh, geological uh, preserves, and other kinds of preserves as well. But we like to think that all of that got started by the work of Ada Hayden. As we reflect on her life, what qualities did she possess that put her at the forefront of the movement to preserve prairies? Dwayne Isley makes several statements in his tribute paper to Ada Hayden that may help us. In one place, he comments about her passion for prairies, saying, Hayden grew up with access to native prairie, fell in love with it, and was faithful to it to the end of her days. In a description of her personality, he states that she has been described as determined, fearless, independent, brusque, and eccentric. Certainly a distinctive Hayden trademark was her independence. And I'm sure that many of these traits were of benefit uh, to a woman who was willing to do field work in those days. We've already talked a little about the work that she had to put into accomplishing her research across the state. How was Dr. Hayden's work viewed outside of Iowa? It seems that she was quite active in the Ecological Society of America and the Ecologists Union, along with the Grasslands Research Foundation. In 1945, she was invited to attend as a consultant the annual conference on genetics and natural history at Washington University. So that uh, must have been quite an accolade. And this conference was led by the prominent botanist Edgar Anderson and at least he must have held her in high regard. And the Ames Tribune reports that she was extended the invitation in recognition, in quotes, in recognition of Dr. Hayden's contribution to the knowledge of the prairie flora of the upper Mississippi Valley, end of quote. So she was known within the state and beyond for her work, for her passion, for uh, all of her efforts that she put in. And I came across a poem that was written by Helen Sue Isley, the, the at that time wife of Dwayne Isley, in memory of Ada Hayden. And I'd like to share that poem with you in closing. And it's entitled, Death of a Lady Botanist. The Venetian shutter of her life had snapped shut. But the recollecting of her seeped through like afternoon. Her unalive rug was patterned with the flowers she loved. Her barium flat, like those she pressed between blotters 
and folded away with paradichlorobenzene. The armchair was pressed too. Indentations of her preserved. It was more of a negative, like those she took of her flowers, out where it should be in and in where it should be out. The whole room was almost a Kodachrome of her. Wait until dark. And it could be the dark room when in should become out and out in. Only it wouldn't. Not for her anymore. The in would always stay out and the out in. The print had been finished already and packed away. Might as well leave the light on with no more developing to do. But there would be the enlargement, memory and legends and the herbarium and albums and books would take care of that. Consequential lives enlarge nicely. So that's the end of the formal part of the presentation that I had prepared for us. But uh, I may stop my screen share and uh, I have some stories that I can tell about her, but first we should check to see what questions we have. Sure, yeah, looks like we're getting some starting. Yeah, feel free. If you have a question, um, now's the time to put it down in the Q&A box on the bottom. We'll check that out. I, looks like we're getting um, one or two in. I, I have a question I'll kick off with you, Deb, here. Um, you know, I think today we're hearing a lot about bringing the prairies back, it's, it's almost kind of fashionable. You, you know, it feels like it's talked about a lot, um, farmers getting programs to do that. But hearing you talk about Pamel kind of seeming like he's almost not interested in the prairies, do you feel like Ada Hayden was just like way, way ahead of her time that Pamel wasn't even had that on his radar? What, what's your opinion of that? I think that may have been the case. Um, I think that, um, well, you know, Pamela, as I mentioned earlier, had to work with the farmers. The farmers were trying to plow up the prairies. Uh, of course, the richest soil, we might even say in the world, lies underneath our prairie uh, sod, you know, or is uh, between the, underneath those plants. And uh, so they were trying to kill the prairie. And um, so with Pamela's work so closely with the farmers through um, sort of being um, a one-man extension as well as a one-man botany department. Um, um, he didn't step up to side with Hayden about uh, the need for protection of prairies. But uh, yes, she, she loved prairies having grown up on uh, one. The, as we know, the area to the uh, on uh, Ada Hayden Heritage Park and to the west is hilly. It's um, got those gravelly hills that had uh, wet marshes and things like that. And um, uh, so it's great that that area had obviously some uh, plowable land, arable land for growing crops. But um, um, it's great that she also had a playground there in those natural areas, both in the marshes, on the, you know, on the prairies that uh, covered those uh, gravelly hills, seeking the first past flowers as they bloomed each spring and all of that. <laughs> you're, you're muted. <laughs> Thank you. I appreciate that. Uh, a couple questions floating in here. I did see one person that commented they had to leave because they were camping at Stone State Park and a poor internet connection. Uh -huh. And I think Ada Hayden would forgive her to forgive them today and say it's yeah. okay to watch it later on. Yeah. <laughs> I thought that was kind of a fun thing. But um, we have a, a question here. Were there particular kinds of plants that Ada Hayden mostly studied? Um, not particularly. There wasn't like a particular uh, plant family that she um, focused on. Like um, we talk about in 
plant taxonomy, the area that encompasses much of the work that she did in addition to the plant ecology that she did. We talk about two kinds of studies and one is more focused on a particular group of plants and that's called revisionary or um, monographic work to um, um, work on a particular family or genus or group of species or something like that. And then there's um, um, floristics. And in floristics, um, you just go out to see what you can find. And that was her thing. She would go out to the wetlands, paddle her boat around, collect all of the sometimes very difficult to identify um, probably both the algae and the, the um, flowering plants that occur in those wetlands. And uh, they can be pretty tough to figure out. <laughs> and uh, yet she loved that challenge and uh, worked on doing that. So, uh, so I think that, yes, her, her uh, plant interests were very broad and it's kind of encompassing the entirety of Iowa's flora. She even there, worked with Pamela on, excuse me, what? That what? It's all there. Why not study it all? Is it's right? That's right. right. She even studied the weeds uh, working with Pamela uh, on some of his publications on the weeds of Iowa. <laughs> so <laughs> while her, her preference was for the natives, uh, uh, she even got some of the non-natives in, <laughs> in um, for her studies. Uh, could you uh, tell us again where Ada Hayden's home was again, the, the farm up north? It, um, I think it is just um, to the west of Ada Hayden Heritage Park. It might even be partially um, encompassed, or at least the land that belonged to her um, uncles or uh, grandparents or something like that. Um, it is uh, within the, it's the east one half of the northwest quarter of section 27 of Franklin Township. <laughs> I know what you're talking about. <laughs> <laughs> I've yeah. seen some pictures of that marked out. I think it's also, I think uh, Topo Hollow is at like the southern edge of it. Of it. Right. And, and that, so yeah, if you can find Topo north... Hollow and find Stonebrook, it, that's kind of running through the dead. Running, middle exactly. Yep. Yeah. I think that that, uh, that pretty well encompasses it. And, and I've, I'm wondering, uh, you know, I've never measured off the distance there to see whether some of it might have actually even been captured within the park. But, uh, and I've got um, some of the, the legal descriptions for the um, holdings of her um, grandparents and uncles and stuff like that too. So maybe originally that was, to them. Here's, here's a great question I see in here. Are there any plant species named after Ada Hayden? Or are there plants that Ada is crediting, credited with discovering or identifying as a new species? I don't think that either is the case. Um, and, you know, you remind me that it's long overdue. <laughs> um, there is actually, though, an insect that it was recently described in honor of Ada Hayden. And it was collected on Ada Hayden State Preserve or Hayden State Preserve uh, up in Howard County. And the authors described the species as a new species of bug, insect. And, uh, um, and the, I don't remember the genus name, but it, the species epithet is Hayden Eye, which uh, um, is named for her. And they, they have a little line or two there about her work that they're recognizing with that. But shame on us as botanists for not, <laughs> not so recognizing her. It takes a, an entomologist to do it. <laughs> well, maybe we'll still find that one more plant out there in Iowa that we didn't know was around and we'll have an opportunity to do that. Right. Yeah, there's been only uh, one species described as new in the state um, that the, the uh, type specimen originated from here and all of that kind of stuff since I came in 1984. 
And that is a little moonwort fern that was described in 1986. And uh, so we don't get too many new, you know, species that are totally new to science here in Iowa of plants. <laughs> All the great people that have done work and found them, found all the ones that were already there. <laughs> yeah. um, here's another question. Um, you said she played basketball. Was that for I ISU Ames? And was her sorority an academic sorority or a social sorority? Do you happen to know those answers? Um, I don't really off the top of my head. She is uh, included in the the bomb, the, the uh, um yearbook for Iowa State um, as being um, on the basketball team, but I don't know what that meant, whether they were um, an intercollegiate team or not. And um, I just today came across the name of the sorority. I wish that I had, had kept that, but um, I think that it was an honor sorority. Um, so, um, you know, it, not for a particular field, but just for, for students, women students who are doing well <laughs> in their studies. What, um, what impact does prairie restoration have on water sources such as springs? You, do you have any information on that? Um, <laughs> I am not the best person to ask. I'm not, certainly not a hydrologist. And uh, um, you said on springs. On springs, or maybe they, just water sources in sources, general, like maybe like our that. aquifer we have. Yeah. yeah. Certainly, prairie, uh, prairie plants and, well, the prairie uh, soils and everything else uh, do a far better job of cleaning the water that goes into, you know, the ponds, the lakes, the, and all of that sort of stuff, so in wetlands and of all sorts. Um, than uh, does, you know, runoff from row crops and things like that. But as far as um, whether it, um, it uh, impacts the, say, output of a spring or anything, I'm not sure. I could guess that as dense as prairie vegetation can be, it probably slows the flow once the spring, you know, water is on the surface and, and flowing. But, that's, that's as far, that's probably further than I should have gone, <laughs> being not a hydrologist. <laughs> I'm sure there are others who could give a way better answer. <laughs> that's where you need a nerve cloth or somebody like that on hand for one of those. Um, <laughs> another question, this is a question kind of related to the park up here. So we're talking about the, um, obviously the eight, uh, Ada Hayden Heritage Park was an old gravel pit mine. You know, they pulled mm -hmm. out, it's an old part of the river where they, it was a big sand and gravel deposit. Um, what would, what would Aiden hate? What would Ada's opinion been of uh, mining gravel and maybe of what happened north of her, you know, her family farm out here in the prairie? How do you think she would have interpreted that? Because I think I, I can't remember if the Hallett's quarry would have started while Hayden was alive. I think it might have came just shortly after. Yeah. Um, Yeah, I looked at a, a plat map also from the 1940s, and it didn't show anything about the quarry or anything like that. But um, my guess is that she would have been sad at the loss. However, I don't know what the land management was uh, prior to that time. It being so sandy and gravelly, I don't know if it was farmable, which is probably the reason that it became a quarry. And so she, um, it would have had prairie plants growing on it. Uh, interesting, you know, sand uh, and sand species and others, I'm, I'm guessing. And uh, so probably she would have been sad to, uh, at the loss of that area uh, as, it was, as it was dug up. And she would have delighted in the fact, I'm sure, that it's being recre reconstructed. It's not a not a native, you know, prairie anymore or anything like that. But uh, at least um, um, you know, diverse seed mixes have been put out there to to mimic a uh, a good quality prairie. 
you have a favorite prairie plant, Deb, that you just something that's always caught your attention, um, you know, new or old, anything that's that kind of this has been your little your favorite through the years? Um, well, I've got a lot of favorites, <laughs> but one of them is compass plant in part because of its height, in part because the leaves orient themselves to the sun, and so they will move, you know, through, uh, through time. Um, and uh, so um, it's showy. It's, um, there's a lot of insects and all that, that make use of it. So pretty important plant in that regard. And uh, so yeah, compass plants are one of my favorites. This one deals with degrees. Um, you said earlier that Ada Hayden had a, got her bachelor's and, and master's at Iowa State. Later, she uh, I think she got a dual master's, one at St. Right. Louis, and then came back to Iowa State mm -hmm. and then obtained her doctorate at IS, ISC. Um, yeah. In those days, was it okay? You know, today we kind of know, like, you kind of have to hop around. You can't get them all at one place. Um, was that permitted back then? Was that okay? Or um, is that still kind of the same rule we know today? Um, I'm guessing that if you had a degree, you had a degree, <laughs> wherever it came from. If it was all from the same institution, that that was fine. My sense was that, um, well, first of all, I don't know when the even the master's program uh, for sure started at. I should know that. And that probably was well, obviously it was earlier because uh, uh, George Washington Carver got his master's at Iowa State. <laughs> um, so, um, yeah, why why she wanted to leave and go to St. Louis to get her, her first master's, uh, I don't know. But... Uh, um, Given that, I guess she was only the fourth person from the college in general to get her PhD, PhD. there probably weren't money rules already in place at that point about those kind of things. Uh, right. Yeah. I mean, getting a, getting the PhD was <laughs> was uh, pretty outstanding in itself. Yeah. A great question. Our last, yeah. I think maybe our last question here for the night. Did Ada Hayden have other contemporary professionals in prairie conservation, or was she the only one? Was there anyone in the U.S. that was doing something similar to that that we kind of see mirroring another professional? Um, I am less familiar with the um, ecology side of what she was doing, but um, you know, Ed, the name Edgar Anderson was mentioned, and um, um, he definitely um, went on to great fame as, a, as an ecologist. And uh, focused on prairies on, he, also? He was. I'm sorry? He focused on prairies um, by chance? I think, I think he did work on grasslands and prairies. Yes, I'm not, being not an ecologist, I'm less familiar with his work than I probably should be. <laughs> But um, I know that he respected her enough, you know, to invite her to come to that uh, symposium and uh, um, and be a co-presenter there, apparently, with, with him. Um, and yes, there would have been others who, um, I'm sure, in other states, um, accomplished a lot. They would be known at least for their research expertise whether they had that unique combination of talents that Ada Hayden had is another question. Um, and her passion to use those talents for, you know, um, trying to draw in the public, the public support for the prairies. In fact, she described in the paper that um, Dwayne Isley wrote about her he described, he uh, had heard her talk about how hard it was to hand, to paint those lantern slides and how the, how fine her brush had to be to do that. And uh, I mean, those are, are delicate little miniature paintings and, <laughs> and required a good bit of talent and combining that with the science, scientific, you know, researcher, 
that was also a part of her and everything. Yeah, that's pretty amazing. I agree. Those slides, those slides are really amazing. We have a, a small sampling that we, when those got brought in to be identified down at our museum, we, we did retain a couple of examples and we, we, we had a few of those on display in 2014 with a parks exhibit and they are, they are very amazing. Uh, once you see them scanned and, and blown up on a big screen, it's amazing that detail that she was able to get into there. So what, what a treasure that those were rescued, found and saved and preserved for yeah. future generations. Yeah. Yeah, I think that those were, as I said, in that batch of stuff that was being uh, being pitched. And uh, thank goodness <laughs> George Kanafis uh, saw that that was happening and, and rescued those. And I want to thank you so much for the program tonight. And I did see someone else that made a comment here. We don't know if Ada, Ada Hayden's work's completely done. Uh, someone reminded me that the Ames City Council is making a decision about um, preserving additional land to the west of the park there so we could see an expansion of protected prairie um, future lands up there so something to keep keep tabs on and it it uh, just shows that those kind of uh, preservation works and saving the those bits of history and nature are it's never done we, we can keep continuing to do more well, thank you. Thank you again, Deb. I do want to remind people um, that was such a great program. I learned so, you know, as someone that's studied Ada Hayden, worked on our exhibit, and there's always so much more you can still keep finding about people. So that was just wonderful to add more detail about her life that even, even I hadn't stumbled upon. So uh, thank you again for that, Deb. We appreciate it. And thanks for everyone for attending tonight. Um, I will remind everybody our next lecture program we have scheduled is June 30th, which will be with Gloria Betcher, presenting Foundations for One Community, the History of People of Color in Ames from the Earliest Times to 1950. So visit our website at ameshistory.org for more information about this and other upcoming programs. We hope to see you at the museum. Um, I'm sure if you want to you know, learn more about the herbarium, you can get a hold of Deb and um, we appreciate everyone. We hope to see everyone at, at the museum or online soon. Uh, have a great rest of your evening and everyone take care. Thank you so much.